Welcome to Sweet Sycamore. We are back with episode six as we dig into the second portion of chapter three of the book of Esther. If you have been in this for all five episodes previous to this, man, am I so glad that I am not studying the book of Esther alone. I hope that God is speaking to you. The scriptures are pretty simple. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And so that's what we're doing. We're just digging straight into the word of God. And I believe that the Lord is going to speak to us. And so today we are picking up in verse seven. If you missed our last devotion, I encourage you to go listen to it because it basically provided the foundation as to why Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. And it kind of gives the prequel to this whole story that happens in Exodus and first Samuel. So go back and listen to that and things may make a little bit more sense, but we are picking up in verse seven. And it says, so in the month of April, during the 12th year of King Xerxes reign, lots were cast in Haman's presence to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. Now, if you remember in verse six, we actually see that Haman is filled with rage and he is deciding that he is going to take out the entire Jewish population. And he literally says, it's not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. I want to destroy all of the Jews. And so now he is taking lots to determine when to do that. And if that sounds weird to you, like we have to actually draw lots, which lots is like a a dice approach, right? It was like, we're going to throw these dice and we're going to see where they land. And that is the month that we're going to take out the entire Jewish population. For many of us, it would be like leaving it up to fate. But for Haman and people like that, everything would have been controlled by the gods at the time. This was leaving it up to the gods. It's almost like they wanted the gods to play a role, but obviously God, the ultimate, the only true God was not going to play a role in actually killing the Jewish people, but he does play a role in this lot. Why? Because it falls 11 months from the day. Do you realize that when they drew these lots to wipe out the entire Jewish population, it could have been drawn for the following month, but it was pulled out all the way to the 11th month, giving the people time. This was ordained by God. Now I want us all to see that Haman was so proud and so confident in his relationship with the king that he is actually picking a date on when he was going to kill all the Jewish people. And he is firmly making this decision before he actually speaks with King Xerxes. What does it say about Haman and what he thinks is his authority and his relationship with the king? So after the decision's already been made and after the date has already been set in verse eight, it says, then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there's a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they will be destroyed, and I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. Now, this was a half truth. Yes, the Jews did have their own set of laws, but the Jewish law did not prevent them from keeping the king's law. In fact, the Jewish people, why they have been in such peace, living in Susa and living in all the surrounding provinces, remember that Persia is massive at the time, and there's a lot of Jews living in Persia, and they are able to be loyal subjects because they can keep Jewish law and keep the king's law at the same time. Mordecai did not bow to Haman because of a Jewish law. And then that is what Haman is relating it to. But that is not why he didn't bow. He bowed because of personal conviction, because of his own integrity, which I'm sure Haman probably didn't quite understand integrity. And we're going to see that as we dig into the life of Haman. And this money he speaks of when he says you will get 10,000 large sacks of silver, this is a lot of money. So where would Haman get this money? It's estimated that it was half of the annual tax revenue, yearly tax revenue for the entire country of Persia. Half of the annual tax revenue, 10,000 large sacks of silver. This would not be something that Haman would have on him because this is the amount of an entire empire. So where is this money coming from? Well, it's coming 
from the Jews themselves. He is speaking of personal funds of the people that he is getting ready to slaughter. He is bribing the king with money from the king's own people that he plans to kill. I want us to read this for what it really says, because never does Haman actually use the term Jews. He never says the Israelite people. He actually never says anything. He says a certain race of people are scattered throughout the provinces. He never lets on how many people this really is. So we find out later that King Xerxes never actually knows. But can I just point out something that King Xerxes never actually asks to find out? See, it says in verse 10 that the king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do as you will see fit. He trusted Haman. He's to the point where he trusts him so much that this 10,000 large sacks of silver, the amount of money an empire would bring in in taxes, at least half of what they would bring in in taxes, that he is willing just to give it straight over to Haman because he trusts him so much. A lot of people actually think that King Xerxes could have thought that it was the dangerous revolutionaries that were in the kingdom that Haman was referring to. If you were a revolutionary and underground at that, then you would have a lot of money and be trying to raise money to fight a war against King Xerxes himself. And so it is believed that perhaps he didn't ask questions because there was no name for this group of people. They would have been a group of people that would have been underground, having a lot of money. And that's what a lot of historians believe. And that's why he just simply trusted Haman, because this would have been something within Haman's job title to oversee. But no matter if that is true or not, we actually see that King Xerxes has a problem just trusting those people around him without questioning their authority or without having his own thought process in the matter. We see that when he regrets getting rid of Queen Vashti. We see that he's going to regret this decision later because he simply doesn't ask questions. He trusts those people that are around him, but he either trusts them or he simply doesn't care. Could it be that he trusted them or could it have been that he was just lazy and was going to allow them to take the lead on this? Either way, he is willing to give his signet ring. And once you sign with a king's signet ring, it could not be taken back. But before we go blame King Xerxes on how foolish this was, do we do this also? The lesson I am trying to pull from this, even for myself, is do I use my signet ring, something that I put out there that I cannot take back, do I put that out there without thinking through it, without asking questions, without speaking to the person or sitting down with myself and maybe asking some personal questions about that? I think of it like voting. Once I submit my vote, it's done. I can't go take that back. But we also have a lot of other things in life that we do that is hard to take back. For instance, leaving a church for another. I have a firm belief that God calls you to a church, but God can also call you out of that church. But you should make sure that God is the one calling you out of that church to another. How about throwing around the D word, divorce in a marriage? Have you ever noticed that once you throw out the divorce word, it is so incredibly hard to take back and your spouse will live with that in their head for such a long period of time? Or saying harsh things to another, as simple as it is, those things can't be taken back. Or leaving a friendship in anger that you spent a lot of time investing in and you wish you would have just sat down and talked to that person rationally before leaving that friendship. Maybe lashing out at a family member or hitting your child out of anger or leaving a job in a rash moment. The list can go on and on. And sometimes we can even justify these things in the moment. But usually the longer the time goes by, the more we realize that those things are justified in very shallow logic. Let's take a lesson from King Xerxes and ask ourselves, do we carefully think through things and ask questions before we act? We have our own signet ring. And it is the words and the actions that we put out. And so we have to be careful and watch where that is landing. Because what we see in verse 12, as King Xerxes says yes and puts down his signet ring, in verse 12 it says, So on April 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. 
Verse 13, as we jump down, it says, Dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. You see, this is the same message system, the same decree system that carried through the provinces that said that men should leave their families. But now it is carrying a different message, a much darker message. And that is if you are a Jew, that you are going to die on April 17th, 11 months from now. Could you imagine knowing the day that you and your entire family are going to die? I can't even fathom what the Jewish people had to be feeling at this moment, but this decree didn't mean something just for them. You see, verse 14 says a copy of this decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all peoples so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. What this is saying is that King Xerxes is not going to be sending out massive amounts of troops into every province to kill the Jews. He is arming the citizens of Persia to make this happen. He is putting it as law so that if they don't go and kill their Jewish neighbors, co-workers, friends, that they would actually be breaking a law and could be prosecuted criminally. It tells us at the end that then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. And I understand that confusion. The people that you spend quality time with, that you work with, their kids go to your school, you shop together (laughs) and the market. These are the people that you are supposed to kill and by law from the king. But the law is also stating that these people are dangerous enemies. And you're probably trying to figure out how in the world are my friends dangerous enemies to King Xerxes. And then there's a thought, would I be next? If I don't really know what these people did, it's not out there for this major fraction that why they have to be killed. Remember, Persia is made up of many different countries with many different nationalities Could I be next? Am I the next one on the chopping block? It's as if the President of the United States said that 11 months from today, you are to kill everybody with blonde hair. No reason, just it's your job. It's law. And if you don't do it, you will be prosecuted criminally. But by the way, anything that is theirs after you kill them, you can take. It now belongs to you. I'm sure hair dye sales would be on the rise. Now, we think that we never need to worry about that. But these people, this was real life. Now, remember that God had called all the Jewish people back to Jerusalem. We spoke about that in a previous podcast. So could they go back to Jerusalem and was Jerusalem safe? Jerusalem was part of Persia. However, when Cyrus the Great released the Jewish people from exile and told them they could leave and go back to their land, he actually allowed Jerusalem to be a self-governing province. So this law that King Xerxes is putting into place would not apply to them. Not to mention, if you had an entire city only made up of Jewish people, then who is going to come and attack the Jewish people when there's nobody in there but the Jewish people? So could the Jewish people leave whatever province they were in Persia, and head straight to Jerusalem for safety. Absolutely. But we have to remember that Persia is a very large empire, the largest empire ever recorded. So for most people, this isn't even a place you can get to in 11 months. For many Jewish people, they were stuck right where they were. Nothing could be done for this impending tragedy knowing that tragedy is going to strike your entire family 11 months from the day. However, there is a but God moment because no one but Mordecai knew that a Jewish woman was in direct relationship with the king, but God knew. And I look at the end here in chapter three, and I think 
So many times in our lives, we are sitting just as the Jewish people are at the end of chapter three, thinking that there's no way that there could possibly be a chapter four, but there's always a but God moment. Haman didn't have the right to choose the fate of the Jewish people. Only God did. When we surrender our lives over to Jesus and we become children of God, just like these Jewish people were, evilness does not get to determine our fate. God does when we live a life of surrender to him. And the future, our future, doesn't exist by chance, just as it didn't exist by chance for the Jewish people. God was orchestrating small details behind the scenes. These people were not Haman's to do with whatever he wanted. They were God's people. You see, I look at the Jewish people and I think, how can you be afraid? Your descendants walked on dry land through the Red Sea. They got to see the miracles of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, all the times where God came through and came through. How in this moment could you possibly be afraid? Why would you think that now would be the moment that God would release his hand on your life? But then I think, well, don't I do the same thing? So many times God has shown up in my past when I thought there was never going to be a chapter four, the moments of dire need and God shows up and I usually see him after the fact and I look back and I see his fingerprints all over my life in those areas of turmoil, of tragedy. But I often forget those things. So when I go through tragedy again, I do the woe is me. Where is God? Why has he abandoned me? When I know that he is still working behind the scenes. And so I think sometimes in the moments of tragedy, we need to be reminded the size of our God, because there will always be a chapter four when we are surrendering our lives to the Lord. God put his signet ring, a signet ring where he put something down and he knew he wasn't going to take it back on John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life that is God's signet ring he says I loved you so much I still love you so much you are a child you are mine so much so that I will give my one and only son and he will bear your sins our sins on the cross so that we can spend eternity together I think there's two big surprises that I have found in my own life And that is that God can love me so much that even when I forget about the past miracles that he has done for me and I still say, woe is me, where is God? He is still loving on me. He is still making a plan to save me from myself and to save me from others. God loves me so much. And that's a big surprise in my life on how much he loves me. But the second surprise in my life is that myself in return, how I can continue to love him and trust him so little. I want my love and my trust for him to grow. So the moment that I'm in tragedy, I look up instead of at my own two feet going, woe is me. But I look up and say, hey, evilness out there, have you met the size of my God? Because that's what I would have loved the Jewish people to do in this moment is to look up and say, get ready, because I know my God cleared the Red Sea. So I know he's going to do something big for me in this moment. And I'm trying to get my own faith to do the same. I don't want to be surprised by my own lack of faith. I want to be surprised at how much my faith increases and grows. So the moment of tragedy, I am not met with sorrow or frustration or being scared, but I am met with hope immediately. And that is what I am striving for. One of the ways my husband and I practice this is we have a prayer jar. So every time we have a major prayer request, we put it in the prayer jar. And we have been doing this since we've been married for the past 14 years. And it has been so cool with our kids now. We go through this prayer jar and we have the answers to the prayers written. And some of these prayers were major prayers prayers and we could actually see what God did. He didn't do what we thought we were going to do. One of the prayer requests was how badly we needed a new car and it was literally hardly functioning, but yet we have an answer to prayer that two years later, that car was miraculously still running. I mean, I would have loved for God to grant us a brand new car, but he still answered the prayer. And so we're able to look back at these milestones, these moments of hardship in our life and see that God came through. It's kind of like when God asked the Israelites to stack up stones after he did a miracle because he was trying to get them to remember 
all that he had done. So in the moment that tragedy strikes, they recall that over their own sorrow. They remember where God was instead of questioning where God is in that moment. Because God doesn't leave us or forsake us. He always has plans to give us a chapter four. And that is what we're going to get into next time on our next Sweet Sycamore podcast.